flat. He is the last Adam. The quickening spirit. The image of God. His unspeakable gift. My peace. He is the offering. He is the sacrifice. The head over all things to the church. He is he that filleth all in all. He is a servant who humbled himself unto death, even death on a cross. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, creator of all things, the, the firstborn, firstborn from, from the, the dead. dead, the head of the body, the church, the head of all principalities and powers. He is my all in all. He, he is, is our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is Lord of peace. He is our Lord of hope. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is the justified, the mediator, the righteous judge, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is obedient and his throne is forever and ever. And ever. And ever. He is and the ever. upholder of all things, the express image of his person, the brightness of his glory. He is Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forever, the shepherd of the sheep, the great shepherd that was brought again from the dead. He is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle and his flesh is the veil which, which was wrapped in two. He is the altar, the offerer, the, the forerunner, forerunner for us. Entered even Jesus. He is the priest, the, priest, the high priest, the great, great high priest, the intercessor, the surety, the covenanter. He is the, the captain of salvation, the author and finisher of faith, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He is crowned with glory and honor. He is the tempted, the merciful, the faithful. He is holy, harmless, undefiled. He is the separate. He is the perfect. He is my helper, the lamb without blemish and without spot. The living stone. He's a cheap cornerstone. He is a precious stone. He is guileless. He is vile. He is the chief shepherd that shall again appear. The day star, my, my savior. savior. He, he is, is the word of life. He is the life. He is that eternal life which was with the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous, the savior of the world, the true God, the true God, the advocate. He is the advocate. The advocate. He is Jesus Christ. He is the first begotten of the dead. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. He is, he is the almighty, which is, which was, which is to come. He is the beginning and the ending. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He is he that liveth. He is the tree of life. He is and the hidden manna. He is the faithful and the true witness. He is. Amen. He is the beginning of the creation of God. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the lamb. So now that you know who he is, now that you know who he is, and I hope you took notes. If not, you can find that on YouTube. I'll tell you where to go. But now you know who he is. I want you to stand up and praise with me. Amen. I want you to worship with me. I want you to praise with me. Amen. As we prepare, I want you to praise with me because you know who he is. Amen. Amen. Savior. 
Winchester that day at Calvary. For he thought he had won a mighty victory. And like him, all of the demons of hell began to cheer. <laughs> But little did they know That their skin was drawing near A early Sunday morning Just like Jesus said
Yes to your love. Yes, Lord. Yes to hope. Yes, Lord. Yes to your power. Yes, Lord. Yes to your strength. Yes, Lord. Yes to your joy. Yes, Lord. Yes in my life. Yes, Lord. 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 Yes, Lord.
Amen. Now that we don't got that workout in. <laughs> Amen. We are going to have a blessed selection from our sister Adrena Clemens. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. 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 We're going to speak his name this morning. We're going to speak his name this morning. We're continuing celebrating the day of the Lord. So we just ask everyone to come in agreement with me as we speak his name. The atmosphere has changed. Nothing stays the same. Heaven is way. For the mention of the name, the spirit is moving, burning like a flame, healing the broken by the one we proclaim, raise him up, hear the sound, chains will fall, mountains move. We lift him high. Speak the name, the name above all other names. Speak the name, the name the wind and waves obey. All of heaven coming down. Fill the earth with the sound. Gather all one hostages of shame, miracles unfolding at the mention of the name. Darkness is fleeing, mercy raining down, healing waters flowing as our lips make the sound. Raise him up, heal the sound. Chains will fall, mountains move, we lift him high. Speak the name, the name above all other names. Speak the name, the name the wind and waves obey. All of heaven's coming down, fill the earth with the sound of the name, the name of Jesus. Speak the name, the name of Jesus.
your name in times good and bad. We will speak your name times good and bad. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we lift you up. This is not about us. This is not about us. This is all about you. Thank you, Lord. I receive. Be blessed. Happy resurrection. The Word of God reminds us that at that name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I want you to just call his name three times right now out of your mouth. Take some time to ponder it and let every ounce of breath in your body be expelled when you call the name Jesus. Are you ready? Call his name. For some of us, the name of Jesus is a name we just know about. For some of us, the name Jesus is one we're acquainted with. He told us that he's acquainted with our grief. He knows even the very hairs on your head. There's a story in the Bible that speaks about a man who called upon Jesus. And many people told him to be quiet because he was screaming the name of Jesus. And the people did not want to be bothering Jesus. And Jesus looked over when he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You see, it's not only until we are going through something that we begin to scream the name of Jesus. You know, you hurt yourself in the house and you hit yourself with a hammer or you cut yourself with a knife and you say, oh, Jesus, oh, help me, Lord. But when you're going through something, when you're at the very last of all the thoughts you can think, all the very idea of what you're going through, it, it just seems like this is the end of everything. Has it been that way for you yet? Have you been through something that you have to call on Jesus in such a way that everything else pales in the sight? That when the name of Jesus is entered into your mouth and comes off your lungs, that things change. The name of Jesus ought to change something inside of you. I want you to give Jesus one hand clap of praise and say thank you for loving me today. Even when I wasn't worth being loved, you loved me. Praise God. You may be seated. Father, we thank you today for those people who've taken the time out of their days, out of their busy lives, and to come and be part of your Resurrection Sunday service. In Jesus' name. I'd like you to stand one more time for the reading of the word. We're going to read from Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew 26, starting at the 26th verse. If you'd like to have your own Bible, then fine. If not, we'll have it on the board for you. Praise God.
The word of God reads thus, Matthew 26, starting at the 26th verse. And it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and give it to them and said, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that special precious day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of you, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night, before the rooster crows, thou shalt deny me three times. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with you, yet I will never deny you. And likewise said also all, all of the disciples. Lord, I thank you again for your people. Give them ears to hear what the word is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of my teaching today is How a Rooster Became Famous. How a Rooster Became Famous. Well, you've heard the story of the resurrection of Jesus a thousand and fifty seven times already. You've heard it mentioned about the fact that he went to the garden with his disciples and the disciples went through a moment of weakness when they all turned their backs on him. It's even told about the one that stood by him throughout the entire ordeal. And his name was John. John was called the disciple that Jesus loved. John stood by to the point where Jesus even asked him. While he was on the cross, his concern were for his mother that was standing at the foot of the cross. And he said to his mother, and he said to John, he said, John, behold your mother. And he said to Mary, woman, behold your son. Sometimes we go through moments in our lives in which we are tested and tried on every side. And we wonder how, is, how are things going to work out. How many times as a leader in any situation, whether it be on the job, whether it be in church, you have people that turn their backs on you? Let me tell you, every one of Jesus' disciples turned their back on him. But it did not sway Jesus from preparing a way of escape and a place for them in spite of the fact that at their moment of weakness, they tucked tail and ran. Many went back to fishing. They turned to the familiar things that they were accustomed to. And so it is in the church today that many people, when things start to get a little difficult, things start to get a little testy, and people are looking at you funny, and people are talking about you. You know, it's okay for people to talk about me. It means God will bless me even more. I remember... God telling Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will bless those who bless you. 
and I also curse those who curse you. So when you hear people talking about you in different places, you need to learn to have a thick skin and say, thank you, Jesus, for the blessing that's about to come. Amen. Sometimes we don't know that a blessing is on the way. But if you work out the way things work, the way, thing, the way God works things out, you know that every time someone tries to put their mouth against you, God has a blessing for you. Amen. Praise God. As a young boy growing up in Guyana, South America, I spent some of my time raising chickens and pigeons and tending to plants. Those were my hobbies. Back in South America, life was so casual and so, I'm not saying it was easy, but it was in such a way that we don't have a whole lot to do. There were no playing video games like many of you do today. There was no going to the neighbor's house and doing things that... Uh, you have no business doing. We had to make up our own fun back in those days. And someone had given my father a couple of pigeons. You might think, wait a minute, Pastor, you raised pigeons? These are special kind of pigeons. These pigeons had a certain type of a tail like a peacock. And when they're happy, they start to coo. The tails come up like an open I don't mean, know if you've ever seen them look on YouTube or Google or whatever you might see them. They had like feathers that went from side to side like this. And I raised those pigeons and they were one of my wonderful experiments in life to take care of. My mom, when she would fix plants and stuff like that, she would repot them and throw away the pieces. I'd pick them up and repot them and I'd make new plants out of old. I also raised many chickens. I would sit under the house. The houses in South America are built on stilts because Guyana is below sea level. And I would sit under the house and contemplate staying out of trouble so I don't get a spanking today. Many of my peers got spankings every day. We always got into trouble. My thing was to try the best to stay out of my father's way so that I don't get a smack on the head or a spank on the rear end. And I would raise these pigeons, raise these uh, chickens. And any time my parents had people come over, I had to be the one to go and get the best chicken. Cut its neck off. Put it in hot water. Pluck the feathers. I know some of you kids are wondering, ugh. That's what we had to do as little kids. And then bring it to mommy who would take it and cook it. And they would enjoy it. That's why I didn't eat chicken for 150 years. We went through many trials and tribulations. But I remember sitting one day looking at what the chickens were doing. And it was late in the afternoon. I just finished feeding them and watching the pigeons doing what they were doing. And I recognized that one bonus to having these chickens were the fact that the hens laid eggs. And I would be able to take those eggs proudly to my mom and say, Mom, here, I have a few dozen eggs for you today. And she would have friends because my dad, as, as long as I had known him, had always been a pastor somewhere. And he would take those eggs to different people who had needs and they would be able to have something to eat that day because food was very scarce in Guyana, South America, even back when I was a child. The worst part of this whole scenario was having to clean out those pens at least once a week. Chicken poop does not smell so good. One day, while I was sitting on the bottom house, as we called it, this was an area where it was, like I said, the house was built on stilts, and we would sit on little wooden crates that we had to build. We didn't have a whole lot of, you know, what are those kind of special chairs that you guys sit in and pull the lever back and recline and things like that? No, we had a little wooden box that we called our chairs. Amen. And as I was tending the chickens that night, things were getting ready to wind down. The sun was about to go behind the clouds and down to the as if you look from where we lived, you can actually see 
the ocean, the sea. And you would watch the sunsets every single day as the sun descended behind the horizon. And while I was looking at it this one day, I observed the rooster going about his day-to-day -day business of keeping his harem of hens in line. He would walk around clucking and necks stuck out way out and saying, come on chicks, let's get into the roost tonight. I, I, I want an early night tonight. And he would walk around, check everything out. He knows exactly how many women he had and he got them all in line. And I watched this one time when there was one that decided she wanted to play a little. So she started pecking a little more, moving a little further away, and this rooster got up and pecked her in the back and said, come on, let's go. It's time to call it a night. You know, God is an amazing God. Even through animals, he can show us certain things. You know, as I looked at this rooster, I saw things I never, ever paid attention to. And it wasn't until later on in life that I began to move this story into something spiritual. I looked as that rooster decided that this hen would not step out of line or step out of pocket. Isn't that the way God is trying to get each one of us to do? That we still want to go around pecking at this and pecking at that. The Bible said a sin is good for a season. Anytime we want to do something contrary. Ever watch your kids or grandkids when they do things? They test your very last nerve by trying to go a little further than the last time. Just hoping you'll give in to them. His focus was on protecting the hens that were entrusted to him. He wanted to make sure that every one of them got into that roosting house, that hen house, before it got dark. The same way God is trying to get each one of us to get into his kingdom before it gets dark. And I looked one at this situation and began to wonder, why was he so intent on being in charge. Now let me relate this to many years later when I look at why is God intending to be in charge over our lives. Do you think perhaps that God knows what is best for us? He knows ultimately that his way is better than our way. He knows ultimately that his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. He knows that what he has in store for you, there are plans of good and not of evil and to bring you to an expected end. So many times we would think, well, if a God will only give me this or if God would only do that or if he'd only do it this way, I'd be a happy pappy. But let me tell you, happiness is what, not what moves God. It's your faith that moves him. Amen? Amen? This rooster, after he'd gotten the last one in to the roost, he stood proud on his perch and began to preen his feathers and repeatedly shook his mane in a proud display as if he were saying, I've done what I had to do today. Now maybe I can take some rest and prepare for tomorrow. You see, it was expected of him not only to watch out for his harem, but also to sound the alarm if some dangerous animal approached his hens. It was expected of him also to herald the breaking of dawn by crowing loudly as if to summon those in earshot that a new day was beginning. It took me back. So over 2,000 years ago, when a similar situation transpired, I'm sure that on that one fateful night, a rooster was about his business of gathering his hens 
and the chicks to settle in for the night, he heard muffled sounds of people mulling around in the dark. But something different was happening on this night. It seemed unusual that there were humans busily going to and fro and he could hear strange sounds that did not appear normal. He knew that something was different, but it did not appear that there was a cause for alarm. He looked over and observed that the hens were roosting peacefully. Eventually, he's thinking, this rooster, this too shall pass. The noise I'm hearing, it's not going to go on forever. Pretty soon they'll all die down and we'll be able to go to sleep. He noticed there were people gathered around small fires that were lit in order to keep them warm. He focused on those who were keeping watch that were dimly illuminated by the light of the fire. But there was an occasional outburst of angry voices that's not the usual thing. But he soon settled in and says, eventually it'll stop. And settle back down to protecting the tents. The need for sleep began to overpower him. He squatted down and began to give in to the overwhelming desire to get some rest because daybreak will be coming soon. He twisted his head and rested upon his back and he had to get some rest before morning comes because he must perform the duty of heralding the day by crowing at the top of his lungs. But all of a sudden, he was awakened by confusion happening around him and it seemed as though something had overpowered him and compelled him to stretch out his neck and open up his beak wide and let out the loudest crow he had ever done in his whole life. Then he fell back into sleep, giving no thought to what he had just done. Obviously, to the role that he had played that would impact all of eternity. You see, right below him, a man named Peter began to weep loudly. This is the same Peter who was asked by Jesus after he arose from the grave when he said to him, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I do. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. A, an hour later, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Peter was trying to convince Jesus that he loved him. Jesus was trying to convince Peter there was aught in his heart. Before it had happened, before Christ went to the cross, a story was told in which Jesus went up to the disciples and said to them, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say you are this, some say you're that. But you say that I am. It's going in and out. Who do you say that I am? And Peter got up and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Peter, I want you to know that. You are blessed. He called him Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood had not revealed it to you, but it had to come from my daddy in heaven. And I say to you this day, Peter, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock of revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then he went on to say in verse 19, And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then he charged the disciples that they should not tell any man that he was Jesus the Christ. I now want to take you to a place in scripture that has been cemented in our minds for eternity. Peter was at a crossroads that day. 
Every one of us have to deal with the crossroads in our lives. Do we serve the kingdom of God even though it seems difficult and taxing? Or do we serve the kingdom of Satan because it seems less difficult and pleasurable? This story of Peter's encounter with the rooster is found in Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62 in the King James. Let's read that together. Luke 22. It says, Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid saw him and he sat by the fire and earnestly looked at him and says, This man was also with him. Peter said, woman, I don't even know him. And after a little while, another one saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter says, no, I'm not. And about the space of one hour later, another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter says, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he yet spake, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the rooster crow, you shall deny me three times. And the word of God says, And Peter went out and wept bitterly. But this same Peter was also greatly used by God to bring many souls to the kingdom of heaven. Because of the finished work on the cross, we too have the connection with heaven in order to affect change in the lives of everyone we meet. Do you know that most people would not ever serve God unless they see you serving him first? We are so concerned many times about whether people are doing the right thing or not. The question should be, am I doing the right thing? Am I living the right way? Are people looking at my life and am I being an example? I'm not that kind of a person that makes people do it just because I say do it. I'm the kind of person that have people do it because I'm doing it too. God is waiting for you and I. We have to get to our crossroads as quick as we can. Anytime we're caught between two opinions, every time we halted in this way and stopped by this thing, or we're looking at who's doing what and who's not doing this, and if our serving Christ is all about what somebody does or doesn't do, then you're not really serving Christ. You're serving the person you're looking at. God wants you to know he's made a way of escape for you. He's made a sure way. I mean, the word even puts this way. There's a sure prophecy that God has spoken over your life. Remember, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times is the same Peter who knew exactly who Christ was. You might know who Christ is, but the thing is, you have to know him personally. This is the same Peter who, when he saw Jesus walking on the water, he said to him, If that be you, then bid me come. And it says, when Peter looked at Jesus, and Jesus simply said to him, Come. That's all Jesus did. It says, Peter went walking on the water. But he took his eyes off. That's the lesson for every single one of us. We have to stop taking our eyes off Jesus. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of the faith. He is the heavy-breasted one. He is the one that we can look upon, and whatever we need, he will supply that need according to his riches and glory by his own name. That's the Jesus we serve. The plans he has for you and I, Church, I've said it before, I'll say it again. They're plans of good and not of evil. But remember, a man always reaps what a man sows. 
So if you're out there sowing seeds of discord, if you're sowing envy and distress and malice and strife and talking about <coughs> excuse me, one another and doing things out that you should not be doing, then the very seed that you sow will come back to in bounty. Some 20-fold, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. So many wondering today, why am I reaping all this pain, all this hard up, all this hardship, all this headache? Let me tell you, you only reap from what you sow. We have reached a place in which we're being asked by God, do you love me? And if you say you love God, he will say, then take care of my sheep. He'll ask you again, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. And when he asks a third time, he's trying to get you to understand that nobody can love like he loves. God is the only one that can demonstrate and display what's called ag ag agapeo, agape love. It's a God kind of love. You and I can only display or show what's called Philadelphian or brotherly love. But God wants us to work towards agape. Amen. He wants the love you have for your fellow man to be just like the love he has for you. Amen. So when he asked Peter, do you love me? He was saying, Peter, I know you can only love to an extent. But if you love and learn how to love like me, then everything you have will begin to grow brighter and brighter and last longer because you're learning to be more like Christ. At the end of that conversation, Jesus said to Peter, let me tell you, son, the reason why I ask these questions. He said, because the devil desires to sift you as wheat. But Peter, I prayed for you. I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And Jesus was looking ahead because he knew exactly what Peter would do. He says, and Peter, when you are strengthened, strengthen your brother. Church, there are many brothers and sisters that need strengthening. But they can't get it because we're not in the place to get them strengthened. The Bible says that any time a person falls, we have to help to pick them back up again. You don't hit them while they're down. You don't talk about them while they're acting up. You have to learn how to love people in the place that God has put them or the place they chose because the only way out sometimes is for you to lend a hand and pick them back up again. Amen. The word of God says the just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. Jesus told him that when he overcame his crossroad moment, when he was strengthened, he should go and strengthen his brothers. There are many orders waiting for you and I to make up our minds that we can assist them in dealing with their crossroads as well. You know, running from God will not help you with your crossroads. Running to God and embracing the church even though they might expose your shortcomings. Let me tell you, most times you go to a doctor or, or a hospital, they're not going to ask you nice questions. And if they took your blood, you can't lie about what you took. God wants to test your blood today. He wants to give you a spiritual blood test. Will you pass? Will you say, Lord, for everything that I have done in life, that if you took my blood right now, it will be as pure as the driven snow. But, Lord, I know I, I, I'm human, but, I, but, you, but, Lord, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. You know what he would say to you? If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, then everything that you do, is okay with me. It doesn't mean we can sin and keep on sinning and, and God has to forgive us. The Bible says should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What I'm saying is that when you do make those mistakes or when you ask repentance over the mistakes you made throughout your life, it says God is willing and able to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
That's the God I serve. Don't wallow in the issues you're facing. If Peter had wallowed in what he was doing at the time, he never would be able on that day in the book of Acts to go out and win thousands to the kingdom. Don't look at Peter and say, oh, Peter messed up. Peter walked in water. Have you ever walked in water? Peter talked out of, talk, out of pocket. Peter was a smart one. Peter cut off the ear of the, of the, of the uh, soldier. He always spoke too soon. He never, as you might say, thought before he spoke. But Peter was the one who went out and won thousands to the kingdom. Whatever personality God has given you, begin to use it for the kingdom. Begin to come into the kingdom of God and do the things that God has called for you to do. The church is waiting to embrace the people. The people have to also embrace the church. We don't talk about one another. We don't look at one another and try to point fingers. The minute we stop looking at the faults of people and start loving them because then we will start to see as Jesus sees. Overlook the faults of your brother and sister. I'm praying that your future will become brighter. When you're awakened to what Satan is trying to do in the background of your life. He's trying his best to take you out. And God is doing his best to take you in. He wants to uphold you with his precious right hand. He wants to show you that everything you thought about him and then some, he's waiting at the door of your heart to help you pass your situations. You might say today, well, pastor, you know, you know some of the things I've done. You know, but God knows even more than I do. And if I'm not holding your past against you, I know God's not holding it against you too. He is ready and willing to forgive you of everything that you feel you might need forgiveness for. At this time, I'm just going to go ahead and stop ministering from what I have in my notes. Because I feel the need to ask those in the congregation that if you're bold enough to accept the fact that God brought you here for a reason today, I'm going to this mic. If you're in the place where you believe God brought you here today, and you wanted to make a change in the atmosphere of your life. See, on Wednesday evening, we had what was called a Seder meal. In that Seder, we spent three and a half hours explaining what communion was all about. That's what a Seder really is. It was called the Last Supper. It was called a Seder meal. But in those three and a half hours, we began to break down exactly where Jesus is, was, and will be when it comes to the kingdom. He always was, he always will be, and he always is. Same today as he was yesterday, as he'll be forever. Those who came, and we had some guests from other churches that showed up, and I thank God for them. They all said they were blessed and they want to come back again. I told some of them, I don't know if I'll be here next time. Because I'm planning, if the rapture comes, to be one caught up to meet him in the air. I'm not looking for this world to keep on going a whole lot longer. Things are getting so tough right now. You know, so many people day after day are saying things to me like, aren't you going to be part of the great harvest coming in? Let me tell you something. I can show you a video that the great harvest is happening right now. I can show you videos in the Philippines. I can show you videos in Japan. I can show you videos in Nicaragua and different places where people are coming to Christ by the thousands while the church in America is still in a state of slumber. And we're expecting this great big move of God in America. But unless America repents, and come to the understanding that God is God. You see, Pharaoh had to come to that understanding. That when Moses and the children of Israel crossed over, Pharaoh came back, he sat up on his throne, and he said, Moses' is God is God. Amen. Church, until we acknowledge who God is, 
You'll never be able to make it where God is. He's calling every one of us right now. I didn't want to say this, but I believe the Holy Spirit is pressing me for the third time this morning to say it. Two days ago, I spent some time in emergency. I went in there because I felt my body was a little tired and I didn't know what was going on. Thank God for the little Apple watch that I have. When I took my EKG, it says you are an AFib. It means my heart was beating out of rhythm. And I began to feel a little lightheaded. And I called my wife where she was. She was shopping with the two granddaughters, buying them clothes and shoes and things like that, having a good old time. And I waited until I thought she was finished. And I says, come, I need you to take me to emergency. I thank God that in the past when this sort of thing happened, I'd be there four days while they do all they can do and get me back to what they call normal sinus rhythm again. I thank God technology has gotten to the point where I was in and out in four hours. They got me, took me in there, put some medication in my arm, got the machine ready, and they zapped my heart back into place. And I kept telling the doctor I'm ready to go home. He says, I already signed your work. I'm waiting for the nurses to catch up with me. They're busy right now. I went home, and usually they say to me, Mr. Clark, take it easy for the next five days. I said, okay, okay, doc, I will. And I prayed that day the doctor would not say to me, Mr. Clark, take it easy. Because I know I had to deliver a sermon on Sunday. I recognized Sunday was coming. And I planned, even though it was talking about the popularity of a rooster and about my childhood, excuse me, while I see God in different ways. He's in everything. There's nothing that we do throughout the day that God is not a part of. Some things he doesn't want to be a part of. But we make him a part of because we're insistent about doing things that we know God is not pleased of. But today is the day of reckoning. And if God is speaking to your heart and saying, this man talked about me in some kind of a way, and I want to be able to say from today forth, I want to dedicate myself back to where God can use me. You see, you might not know everything that you're going to do 10 hours from now, 10 days from now, 10 weeks or 10 months from now. But one thing you do know is that at this moment, God can bring change to your life at this very moment. And if you're one of those people that God is speaking, I don't care how long you've been in the church. I don't care if it's your first time in the church, the first time back. If God is pulling at your heartstrings right now, I want you to forget who's sitting next to you. Step out of your seat and come to the front so that we can pray with you to break Anything the enemy has been trying to hold you hostage to. He's all you need this morning, church. He's all you need this morning. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. I don't care what it looks like on the inside. Jesus is all you need this morning. He's calling you. He's calling you. The bride says, come. You are the bride of Christ. I know he's speaking to some of you who've been here for a while too. He says, come and rededicate yourself back to a place where I can bring change in you. <clears throat> you might mess up again after this. Matter of fact, I can guarantee you will mess up again after this. As I've done many times in my life. But he's always willing and able to bring you to that place. That the enemy will not be able to keep using this as a tool against you. Praise God. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. He satisfies 
my need supply Jesus is all I need Father we thank you for the blessed assurance that when you call we answer that whatever we need in life shall be granted to us today we take no prisoners and every one the enemy has put his clutches into we're claiming back for your kingdom right now Lord today is the acceptable day of the Lord and even though we call this Easter Sunday resurrection Sunday where we go out and give Easter eggs and give gifts and all, all the things that we have been trying to come against in the church. Lord, I'm coming forward today. I'm saying meet the people where they are. Touch them in their point of need, Lord God. Don't let them feel guilty because they lived a life outside of Christ for a while. But today they have made up their minds to come and stand before you. And to say, I am guilty of all the charges that were set before me. And now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for all the things I've held. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I come before you. And I'm asking you to touch my life. Touch my life, Lord God. Show me every place that I have fallen short of what you expected of me. Lord, I've done some, but Lord, you are a crazy God and you can remove those things out of me. You can take away every pain. You can remove every circumstance that the enemy has been having a field day in my life with. I'm asking you today, to help me to overcome the obstacles of the enemy. I renounce Satan. I renounce Satan. I renounce Satan and all of his ways. And I ask you, Lord, to purify me. Wash me in your precious blood that I might be purer than snow. Lord, today is a new day in my life I'm making up my mind and I will never be the same again I'm making a commitment that from today forth I will be working to what you called me to be in Jesus name I pray amen praise God give God some praise right now I, I want you now to just turn around and look at the people in the congregation and just scream at the top of your voice, I am changed forever. They didn't believe you. Say it again. Now, some of you just said it kind of sheepishly. I want you to say it like you really mean it. Let the devil in hell hear you. I am changed forever. Now, give God a hand clap of praise. Now, Lord, I ask you to touch everyone in this line up front and even the ones in the congregation. And take of communion, Lord God. I ask that every one of them have been cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus. They have rededicated themselves back to you, Lord God. And now they're able and willing to take communion. And whatever the enemy has been trying to bring to their minds, I cancel mind control over them right now. I cancel everything that the enemy would try to use against them. Every demonic entity right now is bound in the name of Jesus. And they have the freedom to take communion. The precious body and the blood of Jesus Christ will be given to them to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And bring them to a place where they can see you in your fullness. And today, this day, this resurrection. 
resurrection day, you resurrected these souls back into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. People said amen. amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. <laughs> praise God. <clears throat> what I would like for you guys to do, if you haven't visited our website before, visit our website and put a note on there saying, Things like, today I dedicated my life back to God. Leave your name, and if you want to put your uh, phone number on the inbox, my wife will, you know, return a call to you, or one of our elders will return a call to you. If you need to speak to us about anything and want some more information, it's all available to you. There are even prayers on the website that tells you how to pray for certain things. There's service times and everything else that you need on the website. Please take the time to visit it. And we'll be able to share with you the promises God has laid out for you that you're not left by yourself, that you have someone walking alongside you to keep you faithful. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Return to your seat. We're about to take communion right now. You can partake in the emblems. When we take communion, you come and uh, we will do it the way we do it on Sundays. <coughs> You'll bring your tithes and offerings and put it in the basket and receive your emblems. Return back to your seats. And then we'll all partake of it together. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We had such a glorious time in the Seder the other evening. I felt a special anointing of God in that room. Every table was filled. We should have had an extra table in there, but you know what? I knew God exactly did what he wanted to do, and we thank him for it. Had there been more people, we would have made a way for it, and we would have squeezed a little tighter and got some more people to the chairs that were already there. But those of you who came, I know you were blessed. So I heard nothing but good reports about what the Seder meant to those who showed up. The only thing that was kind of a little bit uh, contrary was this year I opened up a Q&A session in the middle of the Seder. But nobody asked questions about what they might have had questions concerning. Anytime there's a question in your heart about something about God, about his kingdom, do not be afraid to ask it. Amen? The only dumb question is the one not asked. Amen? So if you have a question about something, find an elder, find a pastor, find somebody who can help you to get the answers that you need. Praise God. I'm going to try to go back to my original microphone. Test one, two, praise God. <clears throat> As we learn in the Seder, Jesus was at what was called the Last Supper. In that supper, he took four cups and he shared those cups with his disciples. He also shared bread with them. The Bible said on that special night, the night before he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had broke it, he said to give thanks. And he said to his disciples, this cup and this bread is a demonstration of who I am. They couldn't understand what he was saying because he went on to proclaim that the bread was not simply just bread. The bread represented his flesh. And the cup represented his blood. So when we see that God is showing us something a little different than what we're accustomed to, do not be alarmed. He's bringing revelation of who he is. There are so many facets to God that you and I will never be able to exhaust who and what he is. You saw a little video just now. And many of you remark to the fact that there's so many names to God. Let me tell you, there are even more that we don't even know. 
Just like a diamond sparkles in the light, Jesus is the light. And he sparkles in every facet of himself. On that faithful night, it says he broke bread and shared with disciples. He said, this bread in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember me until I return. <clears throat> I always like to picture the communion as though Jesus was laying in the tomb and covered. And the Holy Spirit, it says the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead was a Spirit who hovered over. And that Spirit, self-same Spirit, is the one who was able to take the natural and make it supernatural. Amen. To take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Amen. You might come into this world not knowing exactly what you're here for. But God can take the foolish things of this world to make it wise. Amen. He will take those people who are meant to be last and make them first. So when we partake of these emblems, what is in the natural, just simply matzo crackers and grape juice, today becomes the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want when you partake of this today, do it with a glad heart. Do it with a pure heart. Do it in such a way that all the sins that you had brought with you are now being laid on the cross. And Jesus is the way of redemption and the way of salvation. And he's making it plain for each of us that we can partake of this. I now remove the covering. The same way the veil was taken off of Jesus, we take the veil off of the natural and bring it to the supernatural. The ushers will lead you from the rear. When you come, you can place your offering into the baskets and receive the bread and the wine. Return back to your seats and we'll partake of it together.
would like to take this time right now to invite those of you who haven't been to church for some time to try to make it a regular habit of coming back to church. That's part of the thing it'll take for us to learn of what Jesus did for us and to work our way into a place where he can use us for his glory. There is not one of us in this room today that God cannot use. But we have to be available to him to be used. Amen? Praise God. I repeat as the word of God declares, the night he was betrayed, he took the cup and the bread. After he'd broken the bread, give the disciples, he said, take this and eat all of it. That's the reason why at the Seder we give you a whole lot more than just a little tiny piece. We want you to really partake and to taste and see that the Lord is good. We speak about the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. Because of the stripes he took, our healing was made manifest. That's why a child of God should never walk around sick. You have to declare your healing. I'm not saying sickness wouldn't come on you. But when it does come, you speak the name of Jesus and evoke the healing power of the blood of Jesus. And the power will take care of the problem. Amen? Eat of the promise he made for us. The Seder Supper that we spoke of is known as the Haggadah, the telling, in which the Jewish people told the story of how the children of Israel came out of bondage in Egypt and came to a promised land. And now because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, we don't have to rush around and do things in secret anymore. Church is coming to that way again in this country. Amen. Many people are having to hide to serve God, but your prayers and your actions can change that. Amen. Do what God is calling you to do. Live the way he commands you to live, and you can make an open show of the devil and beat him back in the places he's trying to gain entrance right now. Amen. In that Seder, it was the third cup that Jesus took, it was called a cup of redemption, in which we have been redeemed unto Jesus through the finished work on the cross. He made a promise even before he went to the cross. He said, I will go and I will die. But on the third day, I will rise again. When he left this earth, he told his people, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We're looking forward to that day. That's why the Jews, when they lift up their cup at the end of the Seder, they say, next year in Jerusalem, today we partake of the redemption, drink of the promise. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Praise you, Lord God. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Give him praise. Give him thanks. <clears throat> Every time we partake of his, bro his broken body and shed blood, when that goes in, something should come out. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Give thanks to the God of God, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Give thanks unto the one who has given us his dear son. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Come on, give thanks to God.
when I was sitting at the house waiting for my wife to show back up, the devil said to me, what about this being the last time they see you? I looked and smiled and said, devil, you talking to me? You talking to me? <laughs> I said, first of all, I have things to do. I have people to see. I have places to go. The work in this church is not done. The work in my house is not done. So, devil, are you talking to me? And he just got up and left. Praise God. Please point your hand to your seat. Lord God, we thank you and praise you, Father God, because you are a God of increase. increase. You are a God of favor, favor. And you are a God that provides overflow, Father. We thank you and praise you for everyone that had to give today, Father. We pray a blessing over their lives. We thank you, Lord God. We pray a blessing that you would make it rich and add no sorrow unto each and every person. And even for those who did not have to give, we pray a blessing on their hearts as well, that you would provide for them in whatever way, shape, and form that they may need on this day, Father. So we pray back, Father God, a hundredfold into each and every person, Father God. We pray that these funds be used for the furtherance of your glory, for the furtherance of your kingdom. In your mighty name we pray. Amen.